Hey, everybody. Welcome to Hope to Go, April 20th edition. Is it April 20th? I think it's April 20th. I, I'm shooting this somewhere back in 2016, and I'm really hoping the Seahawks win the Super Bowl. Go Hawks. Anyway, so when Jesus died on the cross, he was surrounded by his mom, his aunt, Siloam, another lady, probably Mary Magdalene and John the Baptist, five people. The crowds who shouted Hosanna a week ago and shouted crucify a few days ago are shouting save yourself. Probably the disciples are watching from a distance a little terrified. But can I tell you the one thing nobody was saying? Not one person was saying, oh look, Jesus is dying for our sins. And as we've seen, we saw last week, None of the people, none of the disciples after Jesus died remembered that he said he was going to rise again. It was only the Pharisees. But here's the point. Nobody looked at Jesus on the cross and said, oh, good, he's dying for our sins. So let's unpack that a little bit today. We're going to look at the road to Emmaus when Jesus explains the dying Messiah. Now, the problem is we don't know exactly what he said. But we're going to dig into the Old Testament a little bit to try to find out the history of a dying and rising Messiah. And it's going to be kind of interesting. Now, just please note, this isn't going to be one of those messages where you're going to shout, and this isn't going to be one of those messages where you're going to pass around handkerchiefs. But if you really take this conversation seriously, it's going to affect you in two ways. Number one, it's going to give you even more confidence that the Word of God is true. And if the Word of God is true in talking about the Old Testament dying and rising of the Messiah, it's going to be true that the Word of God can get me through this current situation. Amen? And the other thing is this. As you go through this and as you, you look at these subjects, you're going to have more confidence when you're sharing your faith. And friends, if there's ever been a time where the Christian church has to get back to sharing our faith, it's right now. So we've got a great morning in store coming up here in a few seconds. We're going to have Anna the Shorter as well as Anna the Taller, although I haven't seen Anna the Shorter in so long. Anna the Shorter may actually be Anna the Taller, which would mean that Anna the Taller is now Anna the Shorter, and then Anna the Shorter is Taller. And I know it sounds confusing, but I have it written down somewhere, so I'll try to find that and try to clarify it. But we're going to have a great morning. We're going to have an incredible morning. Unless you're watching this tonight, then you're going to have an incredible night. And unless you're watching this in the year 2050, you're going to stop and you're going to comment, wow, Sean's still alive and he still has all of his hair. That's pretty impressive. Or not. Jesus, we just submit the whole morning to you. We know you have great things in store because you love us and you want us to look more like you. And everybody said, amen. Enjoy. All right, ready? Yeah. Uh, when I consider what you have made, the mighty ocean, the mighty stars, the fields and forests, give you
myself is configured here. Uh, I just wanted to say for the record, I am neither confirming nor denying that I just finished playing tennis outside on a beautiful Friday. You're not going to get the truth out of me. Anyway, hope you guys are doing well. Today, for our drive-by praying, we are at... This is Mission Church, otherwise known as Marabou Chapel. I used to be a youth pastor here way back in the day. Amy Cross was one of my students back when it was called Valley Foursquare. And so when we do today's prayer, our drive-by praying, we're going to remember to pray for Marabou Chapel, which is going to be now known as Mission Church. So let's before we pray, though, let me just say one thing. We just had somebody in our church have a, what I would call a very real breakthrough in terms of forgiveness where they could have responded incorrectly but did an amazing job in responding. And I just want to clarify something about forgiveness. Forgiveness is setting yourself free. It's a gift you give yourself. Not forgiving is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. But let me clarify what forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not forgetting. The devil will never let you forget. So you can forgive somebody and still have a kicking around your brain, okay? A, forgiveness is not approval. Sometimes to really forgive people, you need to come back to the realization what they did was evil. What they did was meant to kill you or drive you back to abusing drugs and alcohol again. It's not approval. It's coming to the recognition that God is bigger than what they did. Because folks, if what they did to you was bigger than God, don't forgive them. Okay? M, forgiveness is not a moment. It's something you achieve. You either forgive on a regular basis until you don't have to forgive as much, or you do what, what Don used to say, and you just get reminded, oh yeah, I forgave that person. It's not a moment. And P, permission. Forgiveness is not permission for someone to do it again. Forgiveness is also a great time to set up some healthy boundaries where it's okay to say, you know what? God bless you over there. So F-A-M-P. I fent my fids to fummer famp. Again, I'm not eloquent, just memorable. So let's pray. Jesus, in your name, first of all, we want to lift up Marabou Chapel slash Mission Church. We are so grateful for Pastor Craig and what a great influence he is in the city. And in the name of Jesus, just bless Craig and Cindy and their staff and everybody who attends here. We are so proud to call them a sister church partnering with them to watch your kingdom spread all throughout this region. Lord, in your name, this morning, if anyone here needs to forgive Jesus, give them the courage and the power to say, God, you are bigger. My destiny is in the hands of Jesus and Jesus alone. And friends, I think this is prophetic for somebody. It's really easy in a time like this where you're afraid to point fingers and be afraid of everybody and everything and let conspiracy theories run through your brain. Friends, your destiny is in the hands of Jesus to the degree you're not believing it's in anybody else's hands. So if you're believing your destiny is in the hands of a good politician or a bad politician, that is a degree to which it's not in Jesus' hands. Take it back. Give it to him. Okay? So Lord, in your name, if somebody here is falling into it, give us the courage to say, no, Jesus, my life is in your hands and your hands alone. We lift up everybody who's struggling financially, whether they've lost a job, whether their business had to be closed, whether they've lost clients or whatever the reason is. You are our provider. Jobs, checks, business is not our provider. You are. In the name of Jesus, give our leaders wisdom, whether we voted for them or not. Because, Father, we need to see your kingdom come and your will be done. And we need to see this country get back to work. And we need to see people physically healed. So in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we curse the COVID virus. It has a name. It must bow its knee to Jesus. Everyone fighting it, be healed right now. Give everybody who's on the front lines fighting it, give them wisdom, courage, strength, and, and a supernatural uh, touch from you, Lord, that they will know how to defeat these things. We bless all the doctors, the nurses, the janitors, anybody working at the hospitals or the nursing homes. We give, pray you give wisdom to anybody who's coming up with the vaccine or a cure, Jesus. You, Lord, are the answer to chaos for this country. You, Lord, are the answer to chaos in our life. So, Father, we just claim this today, and we know you've got awesome things in store. Your name, and everybody said, uh, amen. So, you're probably wondering, how can I give to Living Hope? Well, we're glad you asked. A couple things. You can text to give, 7797. They will send you an app, and you can get all that set up right there in your phone. Second way is you go to livinghopespokane.com, and in the top right corner, unless this is backwards. Anyway, you'll see right there in the picture, that's where you can give. 
You can mail it or drop it into our mail slot. We check it just about every day, 918 East Garland, Spokane, Washington, 99207. Or, of course, you can just stick large caches, bags of cash right in the convertible. Where is it, please? Today's message is about the dying Messiah in the Old Testament. And like I said kind of at the beginning, no one standing at the foot of the cross said, Oh, look, Jesus is dying for our sins because the Messiah has to come and die for our sins. This was something that it took Paul and it took the writer of Hebrews to come and extrapolate for the people. It's absolutely in the Old Testament. What isn't in the Old Testament is clearly, of course, is the Messiah who rises again. So we're going to start to unpack that over the next couple of weeks. And it's going to start with a look at something that's called the road to Emmaus. This is out of Luke chapter 24. We're starting in verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus. We don't know which two disciples. We get an idea later. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had taken place. Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Verse 17, and he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? I don't know exactly what that means. (laughs) It's like, hey, guys, what's up? And they stood still looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of all the things which have happened in in these days? Verse 19, and he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Okay, I want to break this apart a little bit, and I want you to see all the elements that go into this. So the first thing we want to notice is, go down to verse 21. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. So they're clearly saying, we were hoping Jesus was the Messiah. And then, of course, at the end of 21, it's the third day since it's happened, and they, so just like the Irish people have a wake after somebody dies, people in Jewish culture would wait three days because that's when they felt that somebody's spirit had left. So that's why... The story of Lazarus being there for three days is so important. They believe that your soul left after the second day. So the third day meant you were really good and dead. And let's break down what we see in verse 19. The things about Jesus the Nazarene. So they're not calling him Christ. They're referring to where he grew up, who was a prophet. Notice they at least agreed on that. Everybody thought Jesus was at least a prophet. The question was, was he really the Messiah? Mighty in deed and in the word, in the sight of God and all the people. So this is as thorough an endorsement about what he did. He was mighty in deed. He healed people. He was mighty in the word. He could teach people. And it's not just in the sight of the people, but it's also in the sight of God. Number of times we see throughout the Gospels, you know, this expression, if you don't believe me, at least believe the deeds. The Pharisees even said No one does the things that you do, so God must be with you. Verse 20, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Once again, these Jewish people fully know that their leaders were behind the death of Jesus. Now, let's also make something else clear. Majority of Jewish people in the life of Jesus never encountered him. If there were two to three million Jews alive in the area, because that's how big Jerusalem would get every Passover, Jesus might have encountered 10, 20,000 of them at best. So the vast majority of Jewish people never encountered Jesus. And they probably also didn't trust their leaders much, because their leaders were people who just purchased the position. It wasn't because they were godly. Verse 22. So these these disciples of Jesus are still talking. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it 
just exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, die. Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So what exactly did Jesus teach? We really don't know, but there's a pretty good idea. Now, we're going to start with the idea of the dying Messiah, because that, well, death, of course, precedes resurrection. Welcome to State the Obvious with Sean. But that's what we, most people, most Christians already know. So let's start there. This is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. But the Lord caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That he was cut off out of the land of the living, there's the dying, for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. There's the part about the vicarious death. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. He will see it and be satisfied. And by his scourging, by his wounds, by his stripes, by his bruise, we are healed. And those are all different translations. So the part that we get is that he's wounded for our transgressions. The part that we also understand that I say all the time is by his stripes we are healed. But did you notice in the parts that I boldened, the resurrection is alluded to, if not outright prophesied. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. He will see it and be satisfied. The resurrection is prophesied in the Old Testament. It's just a little harder to find, but that's why you go to living hope. So now let's look at Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. This is one of the verses that Peter spoke when he gave his sermon after the day of Pentecost. And it points to the fact that the Messiah was not going to be abandoned or see decay. Psalms 2. The kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed. His anointed, of course, is the Christ. Verse 7. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father or I have begotten you, depending on another translation. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the end of the earth your possession. Now, while this is a fantastic thing to pray, I want you to notice the worldwide example of it. The picture we see in God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, and in you all the world will be blessed. When Jesus comes and he tears up the temple, he says, you have uh, made... You have, my father's house is meant to be a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. All right, that expression, my father's house is meant to be a house of prayer, we love, and we put a period there. But when Jesus said it, he was alluding to the whole passage. A house of prayer for all the nations. Once again, going back to the worldwide reign of the Messiah. Now, here is the place where the conflict comes in with people who are currently Jewish. They say the Messiah is supposed to come and bring worldwide everlasting peace. And since Jesus came and went, there isn't worldwide everlasting peace. We as Christians agree, but we believe the worldwide everlasting peace only happens after sin is dealt with. And then the worldwide peace will happen, but Christians believe it will happen in the millennium period. Jesus will be the suffering servant first, so that when he comes back to be the son of David and the son of man and bring final judgment, there will be some people who escape from judgment, and that will initiate the worldwide peace. I want to add in one more passage here. This is out of Psalms 110. This is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, so there's a conversation going on in heaven, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a full stool, footstool for your feet. The Lord has sworn and will not, whoops, I'm sorry, verse 2. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. 
Okay, two points there. Again, the Messiah is going to rule, and it's going to be in the midst of his enemies. Folks, this is why we constantly talk about, we enforce the victory Jesus already won. It's right there in that verse. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is a point that the writer of Hebrews brings out. He brings out the fact that Jesus is going to be like this high priest of Melchizedek, who doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an ending. Now, with Melchizedek, it means he just appears. No beginning, no ending. With Jesus, he has no beginning and no ending because he's Verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge them among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. Well, doesn't that just sound like a cheery worship chorus? The Lord's at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of wrath. He will judge among the nation and fill them up with corpses. I, I, I can just see Hillsong and Bethel making a song out of that. But do you see the Son of Man element? in this passage, bringing final judgment. And do you see the son of David element in there being the final world ruler? It's all there, but Jesus had to first come and deal with our sin. Okay, this next section we're going to go into, we're going to look at a very important element of prophecy. And that is the fact that for Americans and for Western thinkers, when we think of prophecy, we think of prediction fulfillment. And there is an element of that in prophecy. But who the heck are we kidding? I'm yet to meet anyone who's had God tap them on the shoulder and say, sell all your stock because the stock market is going to crash. So prophecy and fulfillment is a part of, of what we call prophecy, but it's not the whole thing. A larger part of what we call prophecy is in patterns of fulfillment, where God says, here is a prophetic pattern, and we're going to see it duplicated. To be really honest, when I think of this whole COVID scare, I don't necessarily think it's the end of times with a capital E and a capital T. I think this is just a prophetic pattern, just like Hitler was a fantastic prophetic pattern of the Antichrist. I think this disease, this virus, is a prophetic pattern of the diseases that will ravage the whole earth during the tribulation and during the great uh tribulation. That's just my thoughts. But let's just go and let's look at a couple patterns we see. The most important one, of course, is life from death. This is out of Genesis 1.11. God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. The land produced vegetations, plant bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seeds in it according to their kinds. All right, how is that for clear? Here's the part you have to understand. The seed has to die. For that which is inside the seed to come out, the seed in and of itself has to die. And we see Jesus say it in John chapter 12, verse 24. He says, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So we start to see Jesus embrace this idea of seed time and harvest, which is really the core principle of all of the universe, sowing and reaping. And now Jesus is starting to put it a little more personal and talking about himself. And so here we're going to look at a few examples of this. In the life of Adam, after they sinned, God killed an animal. And it was from the death of the animal that they had covering so they could go before God. In the life of Noah, there was a death to their current existence and living on the earth in them going into the ark and being surrounded by the death. But life still prevailed within those people who were in the ark. With the story of Abraham and Isaac, in Abraham's eyes, Isaac was completely dead when they started to walk up the hill. And as we saw from many times earlier, the core story that comes out of the Abraham and Isaac is God was saying to Abraham, you are not like the people around you. You don't bring your sacrifice to God. God provides his own sacrifice. And so at that moment, when Abraham lifted his knife to kill Isaac, that was the point of death. And that's where God or the angel stopped him and showed him the 
uh, animal that was stuck in the bush. So from Abraham's eyes, there was complete death at that moment, and from there, God brought about new life. In Jacob and Joseph, this is one of the most powerful ones. In fact, one of the thoughts of the Messiah that was kicking around around Jesus' time was that there would be, just like a son of David and a son of man, there would be a son of Yosef, one who would be like Joseph, whose brothers would kill him and he would come back to life. Because again, from the story of Abraham, I'm sorry, Joseph's brothers coming back at that moment in Jacob's eyes, Joseph was dead. Sure, he was being a lie, he was being lied to. But the prophetic pattern that life flows after death happened when the brothers came back from Egypt and said, uh, yeah, the guy who's in charge of everything, the guy who's who's saving the whole world, and the guy who is acquiring all the land around for Egypt. Yeah, it's your son Joseph. Once again, life followed a point of death. Certainly we see it in the life of Moses. Moses' mom had a death when she put her son in the Nile. Then there was another death where, jo where Moses disappeared and he comes back again and everybody looks at him and goes, who, who is this guy? And there was another death in Moses where Moses had to die to the comfort of being the son of Pharaoh. But then in every one of these situations, he came back. He went through a death, and he came back into greater life. And there's no greater example of this in the life of Moses than when he walked towards certain death in the Red Sea. And that becomes the whole salvific story of Moses. And then, of course, finally, the death in the life of David and Bathsheba, where they saw that child die after their, their first flank. But then eventually... After she was done grieving, they had another child that eventually became Solomon. Peace man. Shalom man. Man of peace. And after they went through the initial death, they saw life once again come back into their life. And then this is the part you have to understand. Jesus is called the second Adam. Every human being on the planet is in Adam. You're either in the first Adam and you're stuck in your sin, or you're in the second Adam and you're stuck learning how to walk in the newness of life. Jesus regained in the Garden of Gethsemane what humanity lost in the Garden of Eden when he said, not my will, but yours. And he walked towards the cross. He was walking towards his death. And this is why we can be confident that Jesus is the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament, is not only do we have scriptures but we also have prophetic patterns of life following death. And Jesus himself said it. If a seed remains by itself, there's no life in it. But if it dies. And that's the picture we see. At the cross, we see God dying at the hands of man to show us the undying love God has for man. And we all probably know that abundant life flows from abundant death. And if you remember the verse that I've been quoting nonstop since Lynn passed, we bear in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest. Every time you say to your flesh, every time you say to your comfort zone, every time you say to your subconscious, I choose to die to my immediate desire so that I can choose the life that comes from choosing what God wants. You have a little bit of death and you release life. <clears throat> and of course, the final story we want to kind of look at is the one that Jesus himself mentions. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. No sign will be given to it, meaning this generation, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. And what do we see in the sign of Jonah, the prophet? We see a dying prophet. Jonah rejected God when he was thrown from that boat and he was swallowed by that large fish. That absolutely was a death. And then what happened? He was spit up in Nineveh 
where he was supposed to go, and he walks forward preaching the most profound sermon of all time. In 40 days, Nineveh will fall. And everywhere this guy went, people repented, and they came back to the Lord. And in that analogy, someone who, uh, who dies, comes back to life, and does God's will, is the very analogy that Jesus points to. So I hope this helps. I hope you get a chance to see that throughout all of these stories, you see the dying of the person who is godly, and then a resurrection of sorts into doing God's will more powerfully and deeper. And even as I was sharing that story about uh, Abraham and Isaac, there's one element of it God just kind of tapped me on the shoulder with. Do you remember when, I, when Abraham lifts up his hand and he's about to bring down the knife on Isaac and the angel stops him and, and behold, there's this, I'm pointing over here to one of my guitars, and there's this ram caught in some bushes. Folks, understand something. While Abraham and Isaac were going up the hill this direction to perform the sacrifice, God made sure that there was another lamb or a ram that went up this side so that the two of them would meet. And I want you to take this as a prophetic thought for this COVID-19 experience. While we may be feeling an element of death right now, for those who believe in Jesus, we can have absolute confidence that I might not see it, but my answer is somewhere around here. God has already sent my answer to find me to bring the breakthrough that he desires. Is that good news to anybody here but me? And then finally, last thought I want you to just take away from this is life is inside life. And new life is released through death. And this is the whole concept of the seed. God always puts life inside of life. And it requires a death of some sort to bring it out. So if you're sitting here today and in the midst of COVID, you're seeing the death of things that you hope for. You're seeing the death of maybe financial security. You're seeing death of freedoms we've all taken for granted. Do not let fear, do not let a belief that any circumstance holds your destiny take you from the absolute belief that if I'm experiencing death right now, it's because Jesus has life for me on the other side. Now, for your friends and family members, they're experiencing death and they're going back to addictions. Our job when we experience death is to say, if there's death going around me somewhere, then there's life that's going to be released. And I insist, and I pray, and I obey, so that I will not ever waste a death experience without releasing the life of God somewhere. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, in your name, at a time that's marked by frustration, and a time that's marked by little deaths, we affirm abundant life flows from abundant death. In Jesus, in your name, we choose aggressively and dramatically to choose your will in the midst of everything. We refuse to give in to the fear. We refuse to give in to the panic. And we will walk in more peace than we ever have in our entire life. Why? Because we know you're with us. In Jesus, in your name, we just thank you in advance. And everybody said, all right, love you guys lots. I will see you Monday night with Sean at 7, Tuesday night with Bible study at 7, Wednesday and Thursday will be Sean at 7, and Friday night will be prayer and worship starting with Andrew and Teresa. Love you guys lots. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>